I want to look at a subject in the Bible that's misunderstood, horribly misunderstood. It's the world's favorite verse, and everybody knows it. It's found in the book of Matthew, and it's interesting. It's Matthew chapter 7. The interesting thing about this verse is they know it more than they know John 3.16. I mean, everybody. The atheists know this verse. The people that deny God, they love this verse. Look with me, Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. Judge not that ye be not judged. Hey, who are you to judge me? What are you, t- what, why are you saying what you just said to me? Do you know who I am? Do you know who my family is? You have no right to say anything to me. They love this verse. And, in its, and it's one of those verses that have been twisted and misunderstood. When it comes to good judgment, I'm the worst. And I want to talk to you a little bit tonight about good judgment. And uh, I, I am not, I don't have good judgment. When it comes to my kids, I try to. But I've learned a long time ago, I've, make some, I've made some horrible decisions when it comes to my kids. And my wife always makes it very evident to me that I've messed up. For instance, you remember the story? You all, if you've never heard this, I'm sure you have. You remember, remember this guy? Put him up there. This guy up here. That dude right there? I try to catch him. Bad judgment! They look sweet. They have little tiny teeth. You can't even see them. There's just two in the front. I don't even know how they chew. I mean, they, but that guy right there is the enemy. I caught him. I thought I had it all under control until, boom, he bit my son. And that may seem not that big of a deal. I didn't think it was a big deal until I found out my son had to get rabies shots. Look at that little face. Don't feel, don't judge me. Don't judge me. It took a long time for him to get through those rabies shots. Look at that face. Take it off. I'm ashamed. Please. I can admit I use bad judgment. But this passage of scripture is not talking about that kind of judgment. This judgment that I used was foolishness. A foolish judgment call. And we make a lot of foolish judgment calls. And we have a lot of wisdom in this room too. That's maybe not too much, but we have some. This passage of scripture is talking about righteous judgment. That's the good judgment it's speaking of. Let's read it together. Again, the world's favorite verse. Verse 1. Judge not that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thy own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother... Let me pull out the mote out of thy eye. And behold, a beam is in thy own eye. Look at verse 5. Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thy own eye. And then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. We know, if you don't know, mote speaking of the sliver that's in the eye. The speck in the eye. Well... The beam is speaking of something much larger. Both come from a log. Both come from a tree. Enough slivers can make up a very large tree. And the root of the problem, whether you have the beam in the eye or the sliver in the eye, all comes from the root problem of sin. And it doesn't matter if it's big or small, you have a sin issue. But the sin issue in this passage of scriptures is centered in on the religious leaders. And this is a continuation of the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus is really centering in on these religious leaders. With their obsession. With the washing of the hands and their traditionalism and all their ideas. And Jesus focuses on them. And he brings forth the subject of good judgment. Now let me tell you something. It is a very foolish thing to say we should not judge. This is why this passage of scripture is so misunderstood. The truth of the matter is, as Christians, we are to judge. It's our responsibility, and God expects us to do so. If you don't judge, then how will you distinguish between something that is righteous or unrighteous? You understand what I'm saying? The Bible says in Romans chapter 16, it tells us 
to mark out device people. You have to, if to mark out device people, you have to use some judgment. 1 John chapter 4 tells us to try the spirits to see which ones are of God and which ones are not. Well, how am I going to try the spirits if I'm not going to judge the spirits? I, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, God condemns the church for not judging one of, amongst them. Understanding division amongst the church requires good judgment. Judgment isn't a bad thing unless it's unrighteous judgment. You have to use good judgment. And there's a way to do it. And if you don't do it God's way, then it is bad judgment and you are wrong. So, are we all on the same page going in the same direction? So I'm going to make this as simple as possible. I'm a very simplistic person and everybody says amen. I like making things so understandable that you can walk away and remember it. So let's try to do this together, okay? Matthew chapter 7 is not denying the fact that judgment is needed. It's, it's saying not to use unrighteous judgment. But he explains to us how to do so. So tonight, together, because we all need it, we're going to learn how to good, have good judgment. Good judgment requires you to do some things. Are you all with me? All right, so what does it require of us? All right. Judges chapter 7 and verse 1. We're going to read verse 1 one more time. Good judgment requires you to judge with caution. Look at verse 1. Judge not that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. This was a common proverb among Jews. What you sow, you'll reap. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. This was very common amongst the people. This was not a shock to hear. When Jesus made this statement, people perked up because they understood. And the religious leaders probably didn't want to listen, but they understood as well. Jesus was saying, if you are going to dish out judgment, be aware, be very cautious in doing so. Good judgment requires you to use caution. Now watch this. Be cautious with your method of judgment. How you handle your rebuke of others is a clear picture of what's going on in your own life. You follow me? Be cautious with your method of judgment. Jesus is saying, slow down. Let me me make sure everybody's on the same page here. If you're going to judge people, be very careful in which way you do so. Your actions... Your verbiage, your personality that you twist to become almost angry and demented and lashing out. That method right there will hinder you from having good judgment and being an effective judge. He says, how we handle it really determines what kind of judgment you're going to receive. Let me tell you something. Cautious with your method of judgment. If you're not, it shows. How we handle our home is also a clear sign of how we, or what we have going on in our own lives. You know, the pastor of scripture says to not to provoke your children to wrath. Usually the ones that are provoking their children to wrath are the ones that don't use good judgment. They're the ones that never took the caution of stepping back and saying, what is my method of dictating or directing or guiding my children, judging them, if you would. How am I doing it? What is my method? Because whatever way you treat them, one day, it's going to come right back at you. Are y'all following me? Because you reap what you sow. And when that 18-year-old's making a decision to walk out of that house, and he pushes you out of the way, maybe it's because you were not cautious as a judge, and use the right method of judgment. How do you judge? Be cautious with your measure of judgment. You know, you better measure up to what you're preaching. You want to shoot everybody down for what they're doing? Where I come from in Alabama, everybody has one face in church and another face out of church. All the ladies, I mean, we are hardcore conservative right where down in East Tennessee. Y'all come out now, and you're going to sit there, and you ladies are going to put on the dresses, and y'all are going to look real nice, And but when Monday comes, well, we really don't care what you wear. 
but we're going to shoot everybody down as they come in that back door the way they're dressed. Pow, pow, pow. doesn't matter where they're coming from. doesn't matter if they're lost or saved. You are going to have a checkpoint in the back door, and I'm going to tell you, I'm going to measure your level of spirituality, and I'm going to judge you. Let me tell you something. You keep on dishing it out, and people are going to look at you, and they're going to look at you with a skeptical eye. You better understand, you keep your judgment to a level that you add up to. You are accountable for self. Cautious with your method of judgment. you got to be cautious with your measure of judgment. Judgment requires you to be cautious. Now Jesus said, before we go anywhere, verse 1 and verse 2, get it. Stop and consider what you're saying and how you're saying it. Because I'm going to hold you to it. And one day, you're going to reap it through somebody else in some other shape, form, or fashion. I've seen some hardcore critical preachers that have dished out a lot. And they have filled their pool of judgmentality to the point they drowned it in it in years to come. Do you want to be that kind of person? It is a very serious thing to sit in the seat of a judge. And we have to be very cautious in doing so. Good judgment requires you to do this as well. Judge with consideration. Look at the next verse. In Matthew chapter 7 verse 3. And, and why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thy own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the mote out of thy eye, and behold, a beam's in your own eye. He said, you got, you got a sliver in this guy's eye and you got a beam in your own eye and you're wanting to help them. you got to stop and consider some things. Good judgment requires you to judge not just with caution but with consideration. Consider your sin. Before you open your yapper, you better make sure your sin, your sin has been handled with God. You are right with God. We've got people pointing fingers when they have so much more on their plate than they're pointing at on the other person's plate. Consider your sin beam that's in your own eye. The sin. The beam is is speaking of the sin. The Bible calls you a hypocrite. You are so concerned, a speck, a sliver that's in the other person's eye. And you know what? Let me tell you something. You really got to look close. How many have kids? You ever have... Ellie always calls slivers blisters. She goes, Dad, I got a blister. I said, where? She goes, right there. I said, that's a sliver. And it's not even really much of a sliver. It's so tiny, I had to look for it. But those little boogers hurt. And I tell you what, we are so quick to analyze every aspect of people's life. We do not stop to consider our own. Consider your sin. Consider your hypocrisy. Do you really add up to what you preach? Verse 5 says, thou hypocrite. People will not trust your judgment if you're a two-faced Christian. The Jewish people flocked to Jesus, not just because he was a profound teacher, but because he was a real person. He was the real deal. Listen, you better consider yourself. You want to judge people, as you would say, help people? Well, what kind of person are you? Did you consider the consequences? Did you look and be cautious about yourself? Did you stop and consider yourself and your sin? Are you a hypocrite? You see, that's so simple. Everybody knows this, but we don't practice it. That's the problem. Good judgment requires you to judge with caution, judge with consideration, considering ourselves before we consider others. But good good judgment requires you to judge with clarity. What does clarity mean? Things ought to be clear, clear clear-cut, obvious. Matthew chapter 7, verse 5, the last verse. Thou hypocrite. I love how Jesus is so blunt. Hey, you're a hypocrite. First cast out the beam out of thy own eye. And then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. Jesus said, I'm not against you helping your brother get the sin out of his life. 
I'm not against you assisting your brother or sister in Christ by reaching in, investing in their life. But you cannot do that with good judgment and help them the right way if you do not judge with clarity. You see the things we need to be cautious with. You see how you need to consider yourself in order to have good judgment, but you have to judge with clarity. Listen. Many times in Scripture, the Bible uses parables, symbols, symbolism, and illustrations to to put across a great lesson or message to us for us to really get it. I love the parables of Jesus Christ. In the book of James, vapor is used as an illustration of life. And then if you look in the book of Psalms, a tree is used to illustrate spiritual growth. All through Scripture, you see these things. In the book of Isaiah, uh, the sheep illustrate us as Christians straying away from God and becoming backslid. And now in the book of Matthew chapter 7, Jesus is using the eye and a sliver to illustrate to us how to have good judgment. So for us to go any further, we have to stop and really analyze and fully understand the analogy of the sliver and the eye. Because if you don't get this, you won't understand how to judge with clarity. So let me explain. And I think you'll get it. To judge with clarity, you first have to understand the sensitivity of the eye. Did you notice he used the eye? Why didn't he use the finger? Who gets a sliver in the eyeball? That, my daughter probably would. She's accident prone. But who does that? That is is one of those things that you would never want. And Jesus deliberately uses the eye, judging with clarity, think on these things, because the eye is sensitive. When you get something in the eye, it hurts. How many have ever had something in the eye? I'm not talking about a sliver, just an eyelash. Those cursed little eyelashes hurt. Or maybe your contact flipped on you and twisted. It drives me nuts. Whatever the case may be, it hurts. It's a constant state of pain. Let me tell you something. Jesus wanted it to be clear to us that in order to judge, judgment must be clear. Judge with clarity. In order for you to judge with clarity, you have to make sure you're not suffering yourself. You said, people are hurting out there. Well, you know what? You need to get some things right before you invest in those people. You got a lot going on up here. Can you not see it? It's like a tree trunk hanging out your eyeball. And you're worried about the sliver in their eye? Does that thing not hurt? Do you not feel it? You know when you get up in the morning and all that chummage is in your eye? And you're thinking, where does it come from? And then you have friends when I was in Bible college that would go all day with that junk in their eye. And then it would harden through the day. It just got worse. And I'm thinking to myself, I cannot concentrate an Old Testament survey because Bucko next to me has some big chunk of something, looks like lava coming out the eye, and he don't even feel it. He's he's clueless. And usually they're the first ones to say, you got something right here. What about the big chunk hanging out your eyeball? That's us spiritually speaking. We have no clarity. We're going around with things blocking our vision. And that sensitivity, that thing that's hurting us, Is causing us to be not effective. I tell you, I've hurt my eye before. I have have hurt it in a way that you would not believe. I am a bald man. And we shave our head. Are you all ready for this? You won't believe what I'm about to say. I had Mach 3. Mach 3. You know what I'm talking about? With all those blades, shaving my head. Well, I was going at it. I was getting the job done. I slipped, went a little too far, and I nicked my eyeball with a Mach 3. Razor blade. I'll tell you how bad I nicked it. I looked on the razor blade, and I'm telling you right now, a little tiny of white was on there. I don't know if that was the eye or from the head, but it freaked me out. And for a very long period of time, my eye hurt. And all my wife could do is say, how could you possibly hit your eyeball with the razor blade? She is a horrible judge. I am suffering. The most sensitive part of my face just received an injury, and you are concerned on how I did it? How about helping me? 
minister to me. Judging with clarity means you have to understand the sensitivity involved. The eye is sensitive. It hurts. Not only is it the sensitivity hurt, but it, it, it'll hinder you. When I was in Bible college my freshman year and I was suffering with multiple sclerosis and found out that I had it. Baby, don't listen. I was going out on a date and I was on my way home and I looked at her and I said, I do believe I am going blind. Something is really bad wrong. All the lights are coming at me like this from the other cars. I don't think I'm going to make it home. Of course, that didn't make her feel too good. The guy that's driving just said he thinks he's going blind. I was hindered in my vision. We finally got home. Her dad hated me anyway, so it didn't matter. I just said my goodbyes and went my way. Needless to say, I went home with a hindrance. It wasn't necessarily hurting. Let me tell you something. The eyeball is not just sensitive to the point that it will cause you to hurt and feel pain. People are suffering out there. They want you to invest in them. They want you to pull that sin out of their life and help them. But you cannot do it if you're hurting yourself. You cannot do it if you're hindered yourself. I could not drive for another six months, almost to a year, because I had double vision. It's when I first was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. And I started my medicine and all that stuff, and things started clearing up because of the steroids I was on. But that was a horrible period of time in my life, because I wanted to drive so bad. I wanted to be able to go where I want to go and nothing hold me back. Do you ever feel like you're being held back in the ministry? Something's holding you back. It could be that big thing in your eye. It's called sin. And you want to invest. Oh, I want to work in the church. I want to get busy. I want to, I want to, I want to, I want to. But there's a problem. You cannot judge and help with clarity if the eye is being hindered. Do you understand? You're hurting. You're being hindered. And you got to get it fixed. Now, considering the eye, you don't just look at the sensitivity, but you look at the sight. Eye gives us sight. And when something's in the eye, it, it becomes distorted. You know what I mean? How many have contacts? You ever fall asleep with your contacts and then they dry out in the middle of the night and you get up? If you don't have context and you've never wore context, you have no idea what I'm talking about. But it's literally like somebody putting some, like super glue in your eyeball while you're sleeping. And then you wake up and you're literally going, what is going on? Was there an alien invasion last night and they took my eyeballs out? I cannot see. I cannot process. And you're trying to blink. And my wife was looking at me. What's wrong with you? Again, the judge. What's wrong with you? My eye, my contacts, they're all dried up. We'll go in there. I can't even find where to go. Everything's distorted. Your sight gets messed up. That's kind of like a backslider. They want to help everybody else, but they're so backslid, they don't even know what, what direction they're going. They have a distorted mentality of life. What used to be wrong is now right, and what's right is wrong. The sight also becomes distracted. Let me tell you something. You get something in the eye, it's very distracting. You ever heard of a floater? I'm using myself as illustrations tonight. You know those little things while you're just, it's a beautiful clear day and you look out in the sky and you're thinking literally back to the aliens. There's an alien invasion because these little things are floating through the sky. They're floaters. And I asked my doctor, I said, what are these things? Why won't they go away? How many know what I'm talking about? Thank God I'm not a weirdo. Be quiet. It's like a snow globe, he said. When you get moving, those little particles in the eyes get shook up and they just float around and you can see them. They're shadows. But they're very, very distracting. You ever find somebody when they get something in the eye, they're distracted. Trying to talk to them, they can't focus. Some people don't even need anything in the eye. They're always distracted. But spiritually speaking... These are the people that are preoccupied with worldly pleasures. You know, I have family like that. They're obsessed. I mean, obsessed with materialistic things. The Bible says, lay not up your treasures here on earth. We're to lay them up in heaven. Everything falls apart down here. 
You're so distracted. You're like those little things floating around in your eyeball and you can't stop from looking. And your vision is messed up. Listen, it also can darken. Your sight can be darkened by those things. If you have health problems, your eyes start dimming. My mom was talking to me and she's dealing with some eye issues. She's had this problem for for a long time. And she said... The eye doctor told her over, and I forget what the disease is called, but over a long span of time, she'll start slowly losing her vision. It'll get darker and darker. I'm afraid to say that these are the lost people. We're so busy trying to pull the, the little slivers out of their eye, we don't even realize that most of these lost people are dealing with one sliver. And it's the sin that's sending them to hell. We're trying to fix them up. We're trying to do all these things. And all they need to know is how to get out of the darkness. How to get that one item that's in the eyeball that's preventing them from seeing light. So, good judgment requires you to judge with clarity. And in order to judge with clarity, you have to understand the situation at hand that Jesus is putting before the people. The sensitivity of the eye, the sight that's hindered But he ends with the surgical procedure. He said, said, thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thy own eye. Because it's causing a sensitivity problem. It's hurt. It's hindered. And then he says, and then shalt thou see clearly. Then you can see correctly. When you get rid of the distractions and the darkness and the distortedness that's messing your vision up. But in order to do that, we got to get down to the nitty gritty. We have to do surgery. The surgical procedure is a necessity to judge with clarity. And what is the surgical procedure? Again, I love you, but you're a perfect illustration of this. My wife is the worst one to be pulling something out of your hand. She loves it. When I get a sliver and I'm working in the yard, she says, let me see that. I know it's coming. She's breaking out switchblade, butterfly knife, whatever she can. How about just a needle? And she starts digging deep. She says, in order to get it out, we've got to dig it out. I said, I'm not against that. It's the way in which you're doing it. It's like digging into a raw piece of meat. It is my hand. You know, is he going to, babe, please, the surgical procedure needs to be with compassion and some care. Can you imagine getting it out of the eye? People, that takes patience. And it takes a surgeon that has good judgment. You know those people that say, get rid of your contacts. Britt Matheny told me this. Get rid of those contacts and those glasses and get the eye surgery. No way. You mean like the scary movie where they strap you down and then you wake up and your eyes are spread open and they're making you watch them jab something in the eye? No. Are you nuts? Oh, it's easy. All they do is peel off a layer of your eyeball. You are smoking doobies. If you think I'm going to let somebody cut a layer off my eyeball. No way. But hold on. They have good judgment. Do you see how many people can see clearly because they took the time that was needed? You have the responsibility to judge. I'm going to tell you a story. I'm going to close. And I told this story years ago. Probably, I don't know, five years ago. How many love Chick-fil-A? If you didn't raise your hand, you're not an American, and you can leave now. Chick-fil-A is awesome. I, you know why Chick-fil-A is awesome? Because they're not just good food. It's not just good food. It's awesome people. How may I serve you? Who says that? Go to McDonald's. They're not going to say that. How are you today? How may I serve you? I love you already. I was the worst when it came to Chick-fil-A. I worked there for two and a half years. When I was in high school and a little bit of time when I was in college. I was awful. I was going through this transitional time in my life where I was the most mean, cruel little preacher boy ever. I, I, pre- I preached against, you remember, the, d- d- don't laugh. You remember, I would, I would preach. I don't even know why people would have me preach. I would say, hey, 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 you, hey some of you cigarettes sucking heat. Hey, look up here. You think I'm joking. You've got to get... I was so out of line. I had no good judgment. I had no right to get behind a pulpit. I was going through some emotional changes, and I was going through spiritual difficulty. I had a lot going on in my little preacher mind. Here I am, 
standing behind the counter of Chick-fil-A. Chick-fil-A that will be in heaven one day. They are wonderful people. They're like, hi, how are you? And my mentality was different. I was a skeptic. I want to tell you something about me. I loved, I loved when people came in, made their orders. I was in the mall. I worked in the mall. And we got all kinds of people. This is Decatur, Alabama, by the way. We're not city folk. I mean, we're just common people, I guess you could say. I don't know what that means. But. And I remember working at Chick-fil-A in the mall, and this guy comes in, and there's a long line, and I'm taking orders. And I always kept tracks underneath. It was the one thing I did right. And, and I'd put it in the bag once in a while. And um, that was a bad thing I did, I know, once in a while. In this case, I wasn't going to put it in the bag. I was, this, I was just angry about this situation. A guy comes in, and, and he, he looked like this. He had the mohawk going on, he had the, but he had more colorful hair. I can't, I, I, and it bothered me. Where's your John Deere hat? This is Alabama, man. Where are you? Are you from Chicago? Are you from Columbus? Where all those other spiky hair weirdos are? No, I'm just kidding. And it bothered me. And he stood in line, and this little girl about this big looked up at him, standing in line too with his mom. And he, she said something. She started laughing. And I'm thinking to myself, yeah, I'd laugh too. Look at him. He's a Fruit Loop. Look at this guy. She laughed, and the mom looks at the man and said, I'm really, he was a young guy, and he said, I'm sorry. She's not from around here. We adopted her. She's from Russia. And then she said something in Russia. And she said, and, and of course he looked at her and said, that's okay. But the thing that caught me off guard is he said, I'm used to that. I'm used to people, and he said, laughing and making fun of me. It's all right. And I can tell you, looking in his face, didn't know what was going on, but he was that close to shedding tears. And then that little girl said something else in Russian. And she looked at the man and said, my little girl just said that you're beautiful. And he said, I've never heard that. She's the first person to say that they think I'm beautiful. And he looks at her and says, thank you. Now, me, I hear all of this. I don't even know how I took people's orders. I'm listening, giving the wrong change out giving waffle fries to people that needed chicken nuggets, you know. I'm captivated. I was so concerned with this guy's life and that sliver in his eye. I was ticked off about this. And I didn't realize that all it was that's going on in this man's life was one little thing called the sliver of sin. He probably never heard Jesus' name. Or if he did... Maybe he didn't understand it. Or maybe he grew up in church and maybe he just got sick of the hypocrisy. And he had this wedged in his eye and he's trying to find happiness and he's trying to find peace. But apparently, according to the way he was reacting, he had an emptiness. And he just needed Jesus. It was just a sliver. I was so worried about everything else. So he comes to me, and he's the next in line. You know what I wanted before I heard any of that? Before I heard any of that, I really wanted to just say to him, you, you look like a weirdo, man. What are you doing? Yeah, even us Southerners sometimes say whatever's on our mind. But by the time he got to the register, something happened. I began to realize what was going on in my eye. <laughs> You really want to know, don't you? I, I didn't have a sliver. I had some big issues going on in my life. Because I was so amped up with my pride and my arrogancy, I never could have good judgment. I would preach the wrong way, and I would teach the wrong way, and I would yell at people, and I had bad judgment. But things started changing for me before I went to Bible college. When that happened, and I started realizing what's going on. I said, that can't be right. Look at him, God. Why, why are you getting on to me right now? I mean, what could possibly be wrong with me? It was like God spoke to me and said, Dave, 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 what, why are you worried about his hair? How about your pride? My pride? What? Do you say God? My pride. 
Yeah, your pride. Look at the pride in your life. You know the pride? How about that arrogant spirit you have? It's just pulling it out. Whoa! Whoa, God, where, what, what are you, where are you going with this? All this is up in this eye? Are you calling me a hypocrite? Yeah, Dave. You can't take the time to get the only, your things, those things you're suffering with out of your life, you're so busy worrying about everybody else's. He's got a speck in his eye. Look, look at you, Dave. All right. But I, I, I really honestly think somebody needs to talk to him about getting a haircut. Look at me. He's almost there. God, tell him just to shave off the spikes. No, Dave, he don't need that. You, you need to reach under that register. And you need to grab one of those tracks. And you need to give it to him. And you need to show him the love of Jesus Christ. But in order to do that, right here where we're at, you need to stop and get that junk out of your eye. That tree trunk that's hanging out, poking everybody in the face, because you're so consumed with self, you can't help anybody else. You're a horrible judge. The subject is not whether you should judge, it's what kind of judge are you? Because a true, loving, godly, righteous judge uses good judgment. I want you to bow your head and close your eyes just for a minute. And I want to do this before we leave. Pastor Tony said this morning, we're the light. We're going to minister to people in darkness. we got to reach out. But I'm afraid that we're being hindered from reaching and letting our light shine because we have so many things blocking our vision. And where there is no vision, the people perish. What is it? That's messing up your vision, spiritually speaking. I don't know, where are you? What is it going to take to get you to get past your unrighteous, judgmental attitude? God says, be cautious. Be considerate of yourself. Consider your ways. And get clarity. Because if you don't do that, you will never be a good judge. And you will not know good judgment.